Welcome to the Manage Engine Insights Podcast. I'm Brent Dorshkin, Enterprise Analyst and Editor of Manage Engine Insights. For this episode, I'm joined by Michael Barata, a master trainer at Culture RX, the company behind Row, the results only work environment. During our conversation, Michael and I talk about Row and its impact on work, how Row improves the work results and the work experience for everyone by treating employees like autonomous, accountable adults and cultivating a clear sense of outcome and purpose. In short, success at work depends on adults' results and clarity. As Michael points out early in the discussion, Row is ultimately a mindset. We believe you'll find this mindset particularly well suited to the relentless democratization of IT and decentralization of work that's taking place today. How cool is this? Michael Verrata. Hey, what is Yay! happening? <laughs> dude, 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 dude. Of course, Zoom was trying to get me to do updates. I was like, not today, folks, not oh, today. <laughs> right, accidentally popped that one. And yeah, you're five minutes yeah. out of the conversation. Wow, it is so exciting to see you, brother. Thank you so much for joining me. For the purposes of, of the conversation, what would you highlight relative to your background mm -hmm. that informs your, your take on Roe? Uh, well, I mean, I'll share what I share with our clients is that, I mean, not only am I a lead facilitator with Culture RX, but I'm also a uh, psychology uh, college instructor, college psych, psych instructor, shock. Yes, enough. yes. Uh, and, and a yeah. life coach as well. So there's a lot of, um, you yes. know, the, the psychology of work and, and behaviors and beliefs that all intertwines this beautiful dance. Um, so that that comes through a lot. I, I'm, I'm overly excited about the success that Roe brings from a business standpoint, um, but from a research standpoint that we've done, uh, how it affects people's well-being is really a game changer with me, and that's why I love doing what I do. Like a fundamental question that's got to come up, uh, just so that we set the context for people that are not familiar at all with results-only work environment is, what is Roe? How do you define it, describe it, basically? And, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, especially now coming out of uh, a global pandemic, I, I think I'll start with what it is. It's, it's absolutely not remote only work. Uh, and that's just the biggest, that's the biggest uh, like uh, misconception about, about Roe is, is that um, it is focusing on, you know, remote work, working from home. And it just, it absolutely is not. I mean, the, the R stands for results, not remote. Um, so we, we do try to bring that home as, as uh, patiently and politely as possible, but we got to, got to continue to remind people. Uh, and then to its purest, it is 100% um, accountability and 100% autonomy, but it's a mindset. Roe is not a program. So Roe really gets to the beliefs of the individual, the beliefs of the culture, which is people, uh, around the way work, quote unquote, should happen. So the, the another, another lesson is there is we, we ask people to stop shooting on themselves and stop shooting on others. Um, and then when you start to apply this, this real, um, you know, pure, what is, you know, what are my outcomes and what do I need to do to achieve them? And then absolutely trust the professional adult to get that done. Now, again, we can flip the script and say, well, gosh, if we're just allowing people to do whatever they want, whenever they want, uh, isn't that chaos? If it's not producing measurable results, it is. But if it's producing, if somebody can sit home in their PJs and eat ice cream and close million dollar deals, what is the problem? Um, but the thing that it's absolutely not, though, is it's not perfection. It is a relentless pursuit of clarity. You, so for you're forever seeking that clarity of what is the work? What does customer satisfaction really mean? And what is the most efficient, effective way to achieve that? So that's what Roe is. No, that's, that's beautifully put. I love, I, I'm not time stamping this, but it, oh, it was only about, it's only about six minutes in that you got to trust like yeah. this, right? And, and actually before that, you're talking about beliefs and fundamental as I heard them, and perhaps you didn't use the word, but fundamental values, sure. like what are the values driving the organization? So Cal Newport's article about a year ago when yeah. he wrote about uh, Culture RX and, and Roe, directly and, and broadly and really insightfully. Love that. Um, we were so happy. Oh my God. Happy. Yes. <laughs> I forget the line, but basically he was talking about how you take these assumptions and implicit implications, all these kind of fuzzy things that are happening in the workplace sure. and turn them into these explicit, as you, as you put it perfectly, clarity, these clear 
goals, these clear intentions, what's desired. Yeah, that's... Um, it's a movement. It really is, a, 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 and it can be a beautiful movement of moving from subjectivity into objectivity, because that's fundamentally what we need to do in, in the work areas to move away from hopes and wishes and bring clarity. And, and that clarity, though, um, tends to scare people off because it is a fundamentally monumental heavy lift when you are talking about changing people's beliefs. And when you, you know, when I ask my students, my psych students on the first day, where do your beliefs come from? You know, I get mom, dad, church, friends, client, you know, so on and so forth. And it's like, to boil that down, your beliefs come from your experiences. So people that are working in a more of a traditional mindset, and you'll never hear me say that people are doing it wrong, because I don't know how to do their job, right? So it's not about Absolutely. wrong. It's not about wrong. But you, you, you tend to discover when you want to examine your own beliefs that you you find yourself, I'm working in a particular way because that's the way I've always worked from organization to organization, manager to manager, HR department, to HR department. So I'm not faulting anybody. I was, I was there. Um, so when I, when I talk about, you know, when we hear about beliefs, it's really the beliefs individually about that you've experienced up to this point. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of starting to dig into values and principles. And I, I, I was listening to a book, The Mountain Is You, and she referenced Stephen Covey talking about the difference between values and principles. And I found that Fascinating because values, as he framed them, are subjective. Mm -hmm. Principles are objective. So right. you can say, we want to be, you know, we want to be the best. Well, how do you do that though? Because how I do that might differ from your your approach. So rather than kind of you know putting people to your word, which I, I love because I use it a lot into this fuzzy sphere, which I tell people it's like a lot of times we we blindfold people and push them off into the fog and say, now get work done. Um mm -hmm. so if we can really just bring as much clarity on the front end, that puts people in a much better position then to not only prioritize and strategize their deliverables for work, but also their livables in their life, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like. And, and I think that's fundamentally one of the big um, let goes for people, but it's also one of the big um, treasures that people start to uh, realize in a results only work environment. It's the challenge of getting somebody to rethink long since decided or apparently decided worldviews and positions and those beliefs then informing the behaviors that we see everywhere the heavy lift beyond the beliefs was like holy crap now i've got to define the work precisely what a challenge to articulate that ahead of time communicate it to somebody take that idea and run that was where i was aware of the heavy lift and Brent, with regard to that, with respect to that, which we fully recognize, because when we get into an implementation, you know, I tell people, essentially, you have to go backwards, forwards, and be present all at the same time. That is a, that's a role implementation, because you have to rethink what you were doing, right? But the biggest challenge is, is getting people to think beyond what I've been doing mm -hmm. is measurably the most efficient, effective way to achieve something. And again, that's what I'm saying, forget right or wrong. But if you think about the way people work, you know, you're talking about being able to define that kind of clarity to a team or to an organization, right? When I ask people if they, if they have that clarity, I, I'll ask, that's one of the first questions I ask in, when I start an implementation. I typically get maybe one or two hands out of about 40 people that say, yeah, I think I've got clarity. Rest, nobody, right? Nobody else. But what people do have clarity on are their activities. All the things I've got to do. But when I say, but why are you doing that? Well, because the, that's just what we do to get, but why, and why are you doing that now? And, and how does that, how is that measurably impacting, you know, the customer or the client? And, and that's the thing, really getting people to let go in terms of beliefs that what they've been doing right now is measurably efficient and measurably effective and that there is no other way. That's why I like to tell people other than traffic signs, the, the words one way is a lie. I mean, that's just a lie. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's a kabillion ways to do things. You know what I mean? So, and, and that's where you want to start with that is that clarity first and then the approach. What, what was coming for me was this idea of when you're talking about the activity versus the results, especially for people that are doing jobs that may be more qualitatively assessed at a certain level versus like, what was the sales count or how many tickets did you close or how many widgets did you produce? Let's, I mean, and, and fundamentally, where I started with Real, when I first got involved, it was when Callie and Jody were getting ready to do 
um, the federal government, NIH, reached out to them to do a federal research study. And it was for an IT department out in Delaware, uh, out in, Delaware, out in Denver. I always point like, as if Denver's <laughs> over there. Um, and then a resident care facility organization up in the New England states. So right there, resident care, that's 24-hour care, 24-7, 365 for human beings that are absolutely dependent upon other human beings to live. So, so that's why like, I feel I, I, I could, I'll sit here and say I'm biased, but when people like to throw, well, but my job, I'm like, does somebody's life depend on your, on your job? Because if that's cool, then I'm with you. Cause I've seen it work in that instance too. But if you're, if, if you're, what you're doing is not life dependent. My point is fundamentally, when we look at activities, one of the most prominent activities that we all give ourselves to is rooted in the eight hour day. And when, if you look at the research, and this is, this is an ego punch for a lot of people, we don't work eight-hour days. If you look at the breaks, the bathrooms, the eatings, the mind wandering, the whatevers, you're already not working eight hours. I'm sorry, go-getter, but you're not. Um, so when, I, when we talk about activities, the first thing is, is to really understand why am I engaging in my work right now at this moment in this way? And that's, so if you can measurably say, well, I need to do this because I have a team member that's relying on me. I have a deadline or a timeline that's actually defined. So I know how I can best time manage and project manage to get it done. Uh, are you, why are you in a meeting? And we all see the funny memes of the coffee mugs. You know, I just got out of a meeting that could have been an email. That's the question though. Why are you in that meet? Why wasn't it an email, right? So that's what we're actually at. But it's tough to get people to drill down into activities if they first don't have the clarity of what an outcome actually is mm -hmm. in their role for mm -hmm. their team, for the organization. When I ask people, who's your ultimate customer? And I get 15 answers. That's a problem because now you have a bunch of different groups and teams trying to actually bring success to maybe their boss or maybe to the team they support. It's like, no, the end result, that end recipient who your client or customers, that's why you do what you do. And that's the connect we have to make. So that's what's going to help inform them which activity should I engage in and when do I engage in it? And, th and that's what I mean, the, the big distinction between activity versus outcome. Because out outcomes are not going to happen without activities, obviously. Um, oh, the idea of um, the 24-hour call center where you might have like no calls at however many out minutes, hours, days, maybe not days, but in other words, there does need to be somebody staffed there. So the question really goes to this idea of, of what that work is, uh, how, how that's accommodated. Because you just mentioned uh, NIH, if I got the, uh, the, the government uh, facility correctly or the organization. But, you know, how is that kind of work or job, I'll say, sure. position accommodated within, within row, especially with, when I'm thinking in particular, Michael, with that dynamic demand and you know peaking and then falling and then stabilizing at a certain point and just kind of all over the place but not necessarily eight hours of you know gotcha. and you 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 actually kind of brought the answer to the forefront of the way you're framing this is you know when because we've worked with with call centers as well a large organization up in C, uh, up in canada cmhc uh, they serve the entire country. They've got a call center. Uh, it, Hennepin County out in Minnesota, they have a call center as well. That's a that's a health, a health and safety organization. Fundamentally, the belief a lot of the times is answering the phone is the outcome. That's not the outcome. That's the activity. Because my next question is, okay, once that person answers the phone, how do you measure what they're doing? How do you know that how they are serving, who's ever on the other end is getting served? And that's where a lot of times people don't have answers and there's a lot of fuzziness in how you actually measure call centers and how they actually you know respond to whatever the asks are but to your point which i think is very important is when you start to look at historically the ebb and flow of business so let's say there you're able to look at data which every organization should have oops i use should needs to have is that okay you know what during these times of the year historically gosh, we've noticed an uptick in our calls. And it might just might be something industry related or what have you. So what should our staffing look like to efficiently and effectively deliver success to our clients? My question would be like, once you find out what that number is, do you believe that number needs to be the same 
during a lower period of less volume of calls. Mm -hmm. Can that be, that's where we need to get people thinking about work on that, that relentless pursuit of clarity, rather than just saying, let's have 20 people all year long sitting around and waiting for calls to come in. It's like, well, but you're, you're telling me you've got ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Why are you not looking? Because the thing is, the work will never lower someone's autonomy. It's only a person that can lower someone's autonomy. If the work is the work, if you're a bus driver, I don't know if bus wheels are this big, but if you're a bus driver, you have got to stop at scheduled stops in schedule, at scheduled times. That's the work. Now, what you do in between those stops, I don't care if you want to get out and dance, throw a party, have a cup of coffee, take a nap. As long as you're at the next stop on time, that's it. But we don't, we don't approach work that way. We approach work from a, from a presenteeism standpoint. Let's just make sure people are in seats, in cubes, in offices, or now green lights are on, or we could, you know, that their, their Skype light is on, or their Microsoft Teams. That's, that's the problem. That's not the deeper dive of understanding what the actual work is. The employee monitoring at a certain point as an IT uh, guy, ostensibly, and uh, familiar with the security ramifications, I get the idea that I need to know what my employees are doing at a in a certain capacity to a certain degree, because now I need to know if that's an actual employee that's accessing resources, or if it's um, an intruder. And that is legit. And I think there's also the opportunity to cross that line where people assume that keystrokes equal, you know, activity equals work, uh, right. you know, yeah. Um, I think the thing explain the way, now see what's interesting is my friend, the way you just explained that, I appreciate that. And this is why I love having these conversations because I always walk away a better person and a smarter person is whenever I hear about keystroke stuff, I obviously jump on that and be like, that's trust. This is an organization saying we're a big, happy family, but we're going to install some keystroke just to make sure your work. But the way that you framed it though, in terms of security and safety to, to at least say, Fundamentally, we need to make sure that the people that are ac accessing our databases, our infrastructure is an actual employee of ours. That's different. I don't think that, see, that's the part that doesn't really make it out a lot. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you. Now, let me uh, back up a minute to some of the history of Roe, because as I understood it, it starts at, at Best Buy. And again, I'm drawing largely from, from Cal Newport's article, it's, it, the understanding of the uh, growth, I'll say, or the the genesis, and Best Buy, if I'm not mistaken, was looking for a way to retain talent that now had additional options in the the Twin Cities area. Uh, and how were they going to retain these people? So, results only work environment kind of takes takes hold now. If I'm not mistaken, in all due respect to Best Buy and to Jody and Callie and to everybody that's involved in it, my understanding was also that Best Buy later on was like, you know, we're not going to do this anymore because we need to respond to not the results, not the work, not we need to respond to the shareholders or whatever the whatever the number goes. All due respect to the numbers, guys, but it, I mean, that was the culture. Right. If I'm that's not why I love that article because that was the story that never really got out. And, you know, because when, whenever people come to us and they they like to point at, well, what about Best Buy? And we try to get into it, but then it just sounds like, you know, we're trying to defend ourselves. We're like, no, you, you got to realize Roe didn't fail. New leadership came in and took a much more financially strategic approach to how they wanted to, to how that gentleman wanted to run the business. That's the truth. It's the and truth. was that even strategic or just tactical? Like we got to bump the share price this quarter kind of thing. That's I, yeah, that's fair. I, you know, I, anyhow, so sure, I'm sure it was seen as strategy to the employees, but well, tactical sure. between anybody, for everybody else. So I feel you on that. Yeah. So how do you change that culture? Or is, is it just, a, I mean, also, relative to the to the implementation, I'd say the initial adoption of Roe within Best Buy. My understanding is it kind of was a land and expand to use a phrase that that kind of gets bandied about within within Manage Engine. It's like you get a taste of the goodness, you get a taste of the application, and then people start talking about it, then it starts to expand in the organization. Well, my understanding was that's how it got adopted at Best Buy. It wasn't like a bam, everybody's doing it. It was like there's. Oh. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. Yeah, J Jody and Callie, I mean, both employees at Best Buy um, were tasked with really trying to understand 
this work-life balance conundrum. That was that's really where the genesis started for for Roe. And the more that they dug into it, what they discovered was it wasn't about work-life balance, it was about work-life imbalance and what was driving that. And what they discovered was that people have demands and everyone's demands are different because guess what? Everybody's different. Um, But their level of control over meeting those demands was not very, did not match the demands, professional and personal. So Callie and Jody started to kind of rework that that calibration to say, well, how can we help raise the level of control that people have over meeting the demands in their life, which include work? Because for the longest time, work has been presented as the nucleus of your life and everything else orbits around it. Roe is kind of pulling that out and saying, you're the nucleus of your life and work is something that orbits around you, as well as if you have kids or you go to college or you like maps or you play hockey, doesn't matter, right? So they dug into that conundrum of trying to understand, well, how do we raise the level? And they, they started to realize that a lot of the decisions, not just from leadership, but obviously that drives organizations, but also from lateral, right? Side by side, people were making decisions based on judgment. They were judging how other people were spending their time, which is where Callie and Jody came up with, I think this is one of the most beautiful things I like to say to people is, organizations do not own your time. They own your results, but we all operate as if the organization owns my time. I have to work eight hours a day. I have to work 40 hours. And if your salary, you have to work whatever the number is, 45, 47, who knows? And they were like, well, that's tough because then you have people that are just trying to put in time like a prisoner, because that's what prisoners do, um, just to look the part and as long as they looked the part, that's okay. And see, that's the thing with Roe. People think it's like super employee friendly. Roe is for everybody. However, if you're an employee that likes to hide in the shadows of non-performance, it's going to be a tough dance. I'm just saying. That, really that's a beautiful, I mean, my, again, my take on what Roe's about and the, and the strategy and the approach, it's elegant. It is so beautifully, elegantly, simply constructed. You've got accountability and you've got autonomy and they just balance each other so well. I've talked to more than one person in a managerial role, if if not a higher executive leadership that asks, well, you know, how do you, how do you know? And I know that this is a, a common uh, thread, but like, how do you know that the employee is working? And, and I've heard Jody on more than one occasion uh, discussing in podcasts and videos. Well, how do you know they're working when they're no. right under your nose? Well, <laughs> like autonomy and accountability. So right. let's see what you did. Like, did you deliver the result that we're expecting? To, I mean, it's like this built in yeah. accountability, this built in proof. Like, yes, it's, it's, it's self evident unless it's not defined or unless it's very poorly defined. Right. Well, and, and, that's, and I want to say, too, that's very important, because as much as we talk about the clarity of the outcome in the front end, there also needs to be clarity of measures and metrics, whether they be along the mm-hmm. way or, um, you know, at the end. Now, again, I feel that Roe really has its strength in accountability in the front end of the result, because everybody is so much more in tune with what needs to happen, that if the ship is kind of floating off course, you have to lean in, because you know, if we don't deliver on this, that's my performance. That's my accountability. So people start to lean into the work to understand, do we need to course correct or we're on the right trajectory? Do we need to reach out to the client, renegotiate a timeline? Accountability, we, we oftentimes in the traditional work environment is strictly punitive. Result didn't happen. Now somebody gets reprimanded. It's like, yeah, again, I can tell you from a psych you know, perspective, punishment does you know, have its effect on correcting behavior. But when we're talking about businesses, why do you want to wait and watch that happen if you can if you can affect it before you know what i'm saying so that's why people say gosh we're having a problem let's have a meeting in two weeks why are you waiting two weeks to talk about the problem that's happening now and that's that's why our other catchphrase is don't wait communicate it's like we we kind of push all these things off to later just so we can kind of continue to uphold this 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 image of people working instead of understanding measurably outcomes are happening. And so that's a big mind shift right there, moving away from the perception of work happening into the reality of work happened, right? I know what happened. I got it. I see it. I see the progress. I see the result. And that's a big shift for people. 
The other big shift seems to be something uh, concerning the accountability and the autonomy is really main ingredients for being an adult. There seems to be such a reluctance to treat employees like adults. What do you make of this sense of like reluctance to give people the, uh, or, or treat them as the adults that they are in every other capacity in their lives? Well, and I think that's the fundamental, that, that is one of the challenges there. And, and again, I, I feel, and this, you know, this, this is based on just my experiences as well, and not just working for CultureX, but having conversations with people close to me. And my, my brother is an industrial engineer, so he's a process engineer, and we have, you know, and he's Six Sigma black belt and all that. So we get into it, and I'm like, okay, this is good. Um, but I fundamentally, it, I feel it comes down to two things. If you look at it just organizationally, um, I feel it's a trust issue. And, and, and right off the bat, if you have a, if you feel that you can't trust your employees, you have a bigger issue that you are not addressing. Then I think it comes down to a power issue. Um, obviously, we still look at status within an organization that it spills out to mean that even though this person is above me in the organization, they're also above me in life. And I think when we start to get people to understand that status, hopefully, is about uh expertise, knowledge, experience, you know, the ability to inspire. So that's why I tell people when we can start to see power being leveraged, not to command and control, but to inspire greatness in others, which includes trust, um, that's going to that's gonna help change uh, the dynamic there. And the thing is, the thing that I love about Roe is it's Roe is not either or, it's and, which means we're not saying get rid of the office. We're saying if the office is the best place for you to do what you need to do, use it. If you can do what you need to do on a park bench in a cafe, in a cafe on the moon in your bedroom, do it there then. So I think when, when we start to realize that there's a lot of people that are invested in, in continuing the way things are happening because of so many other connecting points. And the one thing I'm kind of starting to position is when I, when I hear people talking about get back to the office for the people, right? For morale, for uh, you know, camaraderie. I often wonder, did you get a lot of emails and letters from your employees saying, "We can you get us back?" And maybe that is happening, right? But I also think when you when you think about the real estate investment, a lot of organizations have made in all these buildings and all these offices, headquarters here, satellite office there. That's probably a tough thing to rethink about. Well, how do we transition away from that too? Um, and it, yeah, but that's just, that's where we're going. I didn't invent the internet, but it's here. So you can either leverage it or continue to pretend that it can't help you do basically everything that you, you were doing in the office. Now I look at the office right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, which the, the pandemic was the most brilliant experiment, right? If there was a positive to come out of this is that it showed every organization that work can happen elsewhere and differently. It, I mean, you cannot deny it anymore. So when these people are saying get back to the office, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not going to be surprised if there is a mad rush over the next year or so people come back because, oh my gosh, I haven't seen, Brent, I haven't seen you in like six months. Hey, but I want to know what happens after that dissipates a little bit. And we're like, hey, 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 Brent. <laughs> I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm working now. I've got work to do. Please don't, please stop interrupting me. You know, so I am located in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah. My colleagues all live in Minnesota. So yeah. I never stumble across them in the at the water cooler. I don't see them downtown. <laughs> and yet we get things now again. I but I will tell people, I, you know, the pandemic killed me because I'm a hugger. I love people. I miss right. my family. But while I was doing this, I wasn't thinking, gosh, when can I go see Elliot and Jody? I was like, I miss my mom. You know what I mean? <laughs> I love Joe hanging out with Jody and Elliot on a on a even on a personal level, which I have done only a handful of times, is fantastic. But also in my head, I recognize that's not necessary for me to do great work. It's an absolute bonus, a benefit. I enjoy it. I would never turn it away. But Absolutely. I don't sit here going, I, I don't, I don't take time in my bandwidth away saying, how can I get me and Jody and Elliot together for a cup of coffee? Like that just doesn't go through my head. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Rose seems to be a really future proofing type of work approach. It's not just, as you point out, it's not just about how to remote, you know, remote work 
or work from home or hybrid work. It's not that. It's it's a way to filter out all the extraneous crap that I think really muddies up the delivery oh. of, of the results. And, so and I right? I mean, it, it, it filters it out. Does it matter where you work? Well, if it does, then okay, factor that into the results and define it explicitly. When people hear 100% autonomy, they typically go, they, they actually hear anarchy instead of autonomy, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously. And I'm just like, but you don't understand that what, what you're missing there, though, is the 100% accountability. That's the anchor down right there. Yes, you want to take three weeks off and don't and not do any work? You can do that in a row. But if you didn't deliver on deadlines or you you missed something or you let something down, that's a performance issue. It's not a I took three weeks off issue. It's a performance issue. So we don't care how you spend your time. All we care about is what we're trying to define, which is, you know, guidepost number five out of the 13 guideposts for row is, you know, work is not a place you go. It's something you do. That's fundamentally just it, it boggles people. I mean, that trips people up because work for so long has been about this physical place you go and what we're recognizing to your point about change and this is another thing you need to realize there is going to be a level of disruption in change whatever the change is when you talk about change either you're going to feel uncomfortable something's going to fall down what have you but when we can move away from this belief that i guess we don't really need the physical as we knew it and we can look at now but as long as the work gets done isn't that the most important thing in the context of work? Because when you're talking about what's the most important thing, someone who has a row mindset is not just thinking about work. They're thinking, what's the most important thing in my life right now? And it might be taking a nap. And if taking a nap puts me in a better place to deliver on results, that's what I'm going to do. Instead of just kind of put a hat on and sit in front of the screen. I'm here today, team, you know what I mean? Or run into the office, you know, and drive, you know, like a maniac into work. And that's that's what changes. So when, when it comes down to like, what's important, I ask people, what's necessary in your life right now? What is necessary in order for you to feel personally fulfilled and professionally successful? And that's the 100% autonomy, 100% accountability. Absolutely, absolutely. I forget where I came across this, Michael, but... Um... I, I know that it's that it's fundamental or at least uh, critical to Rose, this idea of adaptive change. And just for my personal sense, if not for the folks that are that are uh, absorbing the information right now, what is that in the context of Ro? what what do you mean or what does culture Rx as, a, as an organization mean by adaptive change? So, so Roe is absolutely that we do take an adaptive change approach, which would be, you know, if you we were to kind of hold it up against something versus technical change, right? So we don't go into organizations and say, hey, if you do these five bullet points, your life is, we don't do that because I don't know your work. You're the experts. Adaptive change though is to your point, which I like what you said earlier about kind of removing you know, the, I would say obstacles, right? And that's what we ask. That's what we really do. We help remove obstacles so you get a more pure understanding, right? But adaptive change is essentially you are now looking at everybody in the organization now has an opportunity. Now, whether or not they decide to take it, that's on the individual. You have an opportunity to help define and redefine what a problem is, what an issue is, what the resolve is, what uh, how, to, how to actually fix something, how to implement something, how to change something. Everyone has a seat at the table. Adaptive change is no longer authoritarian or hierarchical, right? Where it's like, you know, decisions are made up here, then it trickles down, everything trickles down, right? We, in a row, you flip that on its side, it's adaptive. So adaptive change is collaborative. Everybody is involved now. So when you talk about, hey, here are your outcomes, a person in a row with a row mindset, you know what? I'm not really sure what that is. Can we define them together? Uh, how are we going to measure you? Can we define that together? So it's collab. So you want to talk about everybody being in the loop. Now you don't have to deal with, well, uh, you, you never told me that. I, I thought he thought that he should, that she said, you're in it now. You're in the discussion. And if you don't want to be in the discussion and you don't deliver on results, it's a performance issue. That's it. Cut through all the nonsense, all the subjectivity, all the fogginess. And that's what adaptive change, really the biggest switch for people is it's much more collaborative versus authoritarian. And that's, that, that's the big change. When you're facilitating the adaptive change, what are the the core components or or features or processes by which you bring about that change? Well, I'll tell you in terms of working with people, it is it is 
it is beneficial to the change that they want to see and of course that we want to help facilitate when the individuals involved on all levels bring a high dose of humility and curiosity right because humility is i know some stuff but i don't know everything right i mean so you're when i go to facilitations yes i come as a knower i also come as a learner because i don't know you're going to teach me stuff too um and then just that that i'm curious about doing this differently i i i i, I want to be successful i've been doing it this way but i'm sure there's probably so from an individual basis, high level humility, high level curiosity, that doesn't mean that we discount people's knowledge, expertise and experience, bring that, you're just gonna leverage it differently. Um, and then when we get into you know, what this actually looks like, we have to first address how we got to this point. So we kind of do like a historical walkthrough of you know, the evolution of the work, the physical work environment, and then the relationships within work environment to kind of get people to really start thinking, to bring their beliefs to the forefront and see where they have to do individual work. Because much like a society, I would rather point at you, Brent, and say, why don't you fix your stuff? I'll get to me after I see you fix you, right? In row, we're like, nope, you're gonna start with you first. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you want to, you might wanna say, my manager, mm, where are you at though with your, what are your beliefs about the way work needs to happen? So it's almost, you know, we almost take like a Gandhi-esque approach, right? You gotta be the change that you wanna see. Um, and But with, within organizations, we either see early adopters that are like, you know, once we start talking, it's like a light switch and they're like gravitate. Early resistors, the ones that sit back and be like, I wanna see what these crazy bastards are about to do because what's gonna happen right now, right? And then the people who are just fully against it, right? We got, so healthy skeptic, uh, early adopter, and we got resistors. Um, and so when we're able to have conversations about how beliefs are influencing their decision-making and then start to walk them into, well, what is it that you're trying to actually achieve? And that's kind of the big, that's the ongoing dance when we work with organizations is um, being able to say, you know, is that an obstacle or is that something that's actually necessary in delivering the outcomes? And when we get stuck, it's usually stuck because we forgot what the outcome is. We don't know what the, so we just default to, hey, as long as everybody's just in the same place at the same time, we're good. I'm like, well, how do you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? And typically when you take that mentality, you're also, not only are you working on the perception game of accountability, you're lowering people's autonomy as well, because there's probably some people who say, I don't even need to be here right now. You know, I found myself surprisingly empathetic with some of the resistance that I've come across because I could see how easily it was misunderstood what we're trying to do. There's an empathetic tug for people who are resisting because they don't understand what's actually being proposed. Well, and I think that's that's exactly, that's exactly right. It's interesting because this is, you know, we also liken Roe to not just culture change uh, in the context of work culture, but it's culture change just within society as well. And so when I go into these organizations, I mean, there's an organization I'm working with that has 35 people. And we're currently also working, I'm also working with another organization that has uh, 600 people in it. So to get, to get, you know, and CMHC had 2000. So it's like, what I find interesting is the negative still is louder than the positive, right? The, the, and the positive people are, are almost like, hey, this is great. I just want to go do my stuff. I don't, I don't want to have to be a cheerleader. I've just been waiting for this level of respect and trust and clarity. And now I want to go do it. I don't want to have to bring Bill along because Bill wants to fight. Michael, you go fight Bill. I'm like, I don't work with Bill. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we got to do this together, people. Um, so, I mean, it is not uncommon, like I said, to see uh, early adopters, healthy skeptics and resistors all at the same time come up and then to watch them kind of move in and out. We're like an early adopter, like, yes. And then I say something like, well, but not that. So they, they kind of have their boundaries in there. What we're trying to get people to do is respect your boundaries that are in place for you to be successful, but to not impose your belief, which is not a boundary on someone else to live and work the way that you want to live and work. And, and so when we get into that game, that's why I like, you know, I love that you're able to bring up the references, you know, that Jody brings to the table because what's, what we're really seeing now is a rebranding. People talk about hybrid. I'm like, what's hybrid? All hybrid is, is flexibility and remote work put together. You're still asking for it and it's still being managed. Quiet quitting. What's quiet quitting? That's presenteeism. That's all that is. I mean, so it's like, you know, if people, if people can't relate to quiet quitting, and if they've been working for the last 15, 20 years, you've quite quit too. I have. There were times where I was sitting at my desk just waiting for the day to be over. That's quite quitting. You know what I mean? 
So, I mean, we rebrand this and then I think, and I, I don't, I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but I just want to inject this into the conversation. Yeah, please I do. Don't ever, I don't ever dismiss the humanity to all this because the other thing that kind of get, that gets brought up is that, gosh, it really seems like Roe is dehumanizing and very mechanical and robotifying. And I'm like, I feel you on that, but I want you to kind of just step outside of that for a second. You're saying, here's how I think socialization should look like. And what we're saying is everybody should be able to define that through their own autonomy. So if I want to hang out with my real friends, that's what I'm going to do instead of go to a happy hour with coworkers with, I got your back professionally and personally. Yeah. If you fell down, I'd pick you up, but I, no, I've got a family. I've got friends. And I think that's, so what we, I want to say is like socialization personalizing it happens but what's interesting is that people don't want to look at they do it now in parameters right people will like all day long i better check in with my uh, i better check in with my coworker. i better check in let them know how i'm spending my time between nine and five but how many of you call people at nine o'clock at night and say listen i'm just i'm in my jammies i'm getting ready to go to bed just wanted to check in how many of you call each other on saturday say i'm going grocery shopping i just want to let you know where i'm going so even even though we think the intention is this pure intention you're doing it in a parameter that's only nine to five Monday through Friday. Seems like after five o'clock every day and definitely on the weekends, <laughs> don't bother me, coworker. Don't bother me. So it's not about dehumanizing. It's absolutely more about raising the level of control about how anybody else wants to spend their time in any given moment. That's really what it is. But my take on what is really jamming people up is that they know that's the, the I, had, I had to look this up. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't. They know what work is. They know what they're supposed to do. They know how they get, they accrue their paycheck. And that's all familiar and it's, and it's been set in stone. And, and to replace that with the unknown, despite the rose, like, wow, this could be a game changer, but it's the game hasn't been changed yet. They're still playing their, their old game or they're in that transitional space. That's, that's a, that's a tough and I love that you said, yeah. I love that you, I, I love that you brought that up because one of the first things I, before I define adaptive change, which I felt like I was right in a session, because that's what I do. That's one of the second points. I mean, the first point I make though, is I ask the group, you know, are you willing to unlearn? Because that's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. And what does that really mean? It means to set aside all of your accumulated knowledge to lean into the unfamiliar with humility and curiosity. And so to your point, Sometimes that unknown becomes such an obstacle. And then I just pull on my psych teaching and I'm just like, do you have a best friend? Yes, of course I do. Do you remember when they were a stranger? Oh, remember that food you never had? And then you tried it. Oh, remember that place you never went? And then you went, oh, so that's, that's life. I mean, Alan Watts, one of my favorite philosophers, you know, change is just another word for life. That's all it is. So the more that you can lean in, and when you're talking about the context of work, it's like you're not on an island. If you feel like you are on an island, that you can't, you want to see the true test of, 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 of team dynamics and organizational dynamics. How comfortable do people say feel saying, I don't know, I need help? When you can get teams to feel people to feel comfortable saying, I have no idea what any of you are talking about. Can somebody please help me? When people feel a hundred percent comfortable to do that then you know you're actually in a psychologically safe and supportive work environment. But if people are afraid to say, I don't know, and they just take work, gobble it up, head down, stress out, pretzel up, and just try to get things done, that's not healthy. I mean, that's not healthy. But yet we reward the, the head down hustle approach to work, right? And then we don't understand, why is Bill out sick two days in a row? Why is that any of your business? And did you help him last week when he asked for help? You know what I'm saying? Business benefits. I mean, if you are the best by financials driven you know, leader or company manager or organization overall looking at a results only work environment, they're like, like just bottom line stuff that Roe brings to bear. Would you care to comment on those types of, of points? Like, yeah, so, you know, when I think about, and, and Elliot and I, um, cause you originally were reaching out. So, Elliot, and I told Elliot, yes, I'm yes. Like, today with Brent and he's like, Oh my gosh, finally. I'm like, I know we're in it. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, we were, Ellie and I like are forever, <coughs> excuse me, having these conversations. And the one thing is when having the logic conversation in a beliefs conversation is, is tough sometimes, right? And so when yes. we look at business results, I mean, we do have, we have 
research, we have case studies, we have organizational own provided, you know, reports of here are our pain, our pain points, don't went through row, here's what changed, right? So there's that data there. But fundamentally, when you look at when I when I talk to people about, about this, I'm like, if you're going to argue against row, you're basically arguing against focusing on results. And is that not what you want everyone in your organization focused on, right? I mean, fundamentally, like, that's what we're saying, like, focus on what the outcome is and deliver it measurably. So when we look at organizations or industries, it does not matter which one, it is the ability to say, okay, what is a pain point? If you're looking for how to improve productivity and engagement, well, then you you also have to address waste. You have to address uh, inefficiencies, ineffective processes, procedures, methodologies, also cultural attributes like meetings and commutes and things like that. If you want that productivity to really reach that higher level, you've got to kind of take the, the weights off people. And sometimes those weights are the things I just mentioned. If you want um, you know, to raise morale and, and have a more of a psychologically safe, um, dedicated you know, team dynamic, well, then you've got to infuse autonomy. You've got to let people know we trust you, not just in this moment, we trust you all the time. And that unleashes then that willingness because what's, what's interesting is and I have this great, if you don't mind, this great story when I did the resident care, uh, which was you know over two years, 15 locations, I'm going all over the place, all over the New England states. And a nurse came to me and said, Michael, you changed my life. And I'm like, whoa, time out. How did I change your life? I was like, I got in front of you and danced. You did all the work. And they had a belief that the only way to provide 24-hour care was with three consecutive eight-hour shifts. Does that sound surprising? That's everywhere. Seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven. When we got in there, we started to ask them, let's move away from the schedule mindset and focus on coverage. Let's get crystal clear about what needs to happen when. When do, when does, uh, when do meals have to happen? When, does, when do activities? When is bathing? When does sleep? When does medicine distribution? Let's get clear. And then of course the what if emergency. So gotta be safe, gotta be legal, gotta be cost neutral. They had people working all over the place. They had 16 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts, eight hour split fours, a five, three, a six and a two. I mean, it was all over the place. It took, it took a while though for them to actually fit this and make this work. And of course there was belief, nobody's ever gonna work, wanna work at night. I wanna work at night. The, the, no one's gonna work on, the work, on, work on the weekends. I wanna work weekends because we operate on this assumption that we know what other people want. So I said, can, how, did I, how did your life change? Um, can I guess? You got more money? No. You got more time off. No. Oh, I'm sorry. You got a promotion, upward mobility. Those are the three things, right? Aren't they the three things? No. I said, well, then what happened? Michael, ever since we went to a results only work environment, I was able to change, you know, when I, when I start. So I was able to walk my daughter to the school bus in the morning and I'm sitting there going, okay. And I mean, I felt insulting, right? I felt like I was insulting. I'm like, cause I was waiting for some big, She's like, Michael, I don't know if that's landing. Since I've been working, not just here, since I've been an employee, right? I've never been able to do that with my daughter. So when you talk about what autonomy actually does, it not only frees people up to leverage all of their, their talents and their, 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 their uh, mastery so they can provide the best result, but it puts them in a, a better place to enjoy their life. Now, if they're enjoying their life and they're bringing that to their work, don't you remember growing up, a happy worker is a good work. What happened to that? What happened to that, right? right? So these are the things that absolutely do change, but they don't change overnight. And sometimes you're going to have to trip, fall, learn to get there. So I think what happens when we talk about changing beliefs, people's egos get pinged. And then when we start to say things like it's a heavy lift because it is, then it's just like, oh my gosh, effort. And that's why I tell people, I'm like, People don't resist change, right? If people can wave a magic wand, they'd make change happen. So they're not resistant to change. They're resistant to the effort needed to make and sustain change happening. That's what they're resistant to, right? If you could say, Absolutely. change everything that I don't like, you'd do it in a second. But if I'm saying, hey, listen, in order for that to happen, you got to like help. Nah, not today. So that's what we have to focus in on. If we're going to be real about the conversation, let's, you know, let's be real about it. Absolutely. I think the change is almost mandatory at this point, the shift to a results only work environment, at least perspective, at least the willingness of an organization and organizational leaders to accommodate this sense of increased, if not ideally 100% 
autonomy and 100% accountability. When it comes to computer technology, software, IT, information technology in general, it's just expanding. It's just increasing and the, and the flow of it is out into the world. We call it the democratization of IT. Now, that's, as I think of it, antithetical to the centralization, the command and control where one person is telling you what to do. There's a lot of things that are happening that I need to be able to take action like here and now, like immediately. I can't wait. I can't, you know, sit sit on the sidelines and wait for somebody up there to figure out what I need to do down here. It needs to happen pronto. I like what you said about too, about like, you know, how it's it's you know ever expanding and, and you're you know you're kind of you know going towards it. It reminds me, which I bring up to people in row, I, this is a concept that fits perfectly with row is self-actualization. Self-actualization in psychology means you never get there. You're forever maximizing your potential in the moment, right? In your own unique way. People forget the unique way part of that definition, but mm. that's what's interesting when, when, when you talk about that in this way, it's like, you know, autonomy also puts people in the better position to be creative and innovative. I tell people, I'm like, you talk about innovation, but yet you tell people how, when, and where to work. Mm. How do you think that's actually affecting their mindsets around now you want, I, I'm in a box, but you want me to, what they're going to try to do is innovate their way out of the box, which is typically out of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than innovate some kind of strategy that could benefit the organization. They're just going to, hey, if this is how you're going to, if this is how I'm going to be treated, I'm just going to do what I need to do to not get my, not, not get scalped, right? You know what I'm saying? So Absolutely. I think the focus here is when you're able to actually trust people enough with clarity, and that's the key component. I trust you based on what we agree needs to happen. Now go do it. And we also know how we're going to measure what you're doing, right? So there's no no big surprises there either. Uh, because in row performance management is an ongoing conversation. It is not uh, something that I, like an event every three months, we're going to get together. I'm like, hey, those three things you did wrong for the past three months, we're going to address them now. What? Somehow I've, I've absorbed the idea that, that Roe is concerned with the purpose. So beyond or related to somehow interwoven with results, autonomy and accountability is the sense of purpose. What role does it play in, in your understanding for the organization and the philosophy value role of purpose? So what's interesting about that, when we had that conversation around purpose and, and you know, because people have vision statements, missions, mission statements, values, mm -hmm. right? So there's all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And really what we're fundamentally asking people to do is as an organization, get crystal clear about what the ultimate outcome is of the organization and what the, and who the ultimate customer is. But then we drill down and say, okay, now what is the purpose of each team and each individual and how does it align with that, with achieving and supporting that ultimate outcome and ultimate customer? And that's where the, the role mindset, to your point, which you got great, is it's tough to see the purpose and the outcome when we're looking at all this other stuff or when we're looking over here, right? So if we can remove obstacles from people so that we can align, there's better, and I like to use the word alignment. So there's alignment with role, team, and organization. That's what puts people in a much better position to actually have to, to have an actionable, measurable purpose. Because we could sit here all day and say, my company, we're here to be great. Well, how do you know you're being great? I mean, how, how do you measure that? Right. What, what, what tells you that you are being great versus our ultimate outcome is to deliver this. Our ultimate customer is this. Here are all our teams and individuals. What are we doing and how do we know what we're doing individually and team wise? supporting that and driving those outcomes and supporting those clients. So that's where Roe, I feel, crystallizes the purpose individually in terms of role, but also in terms of team. When I was thinking about purpose relative to results and, and defining the work explicitly, clearly, precisely, or as precisely as possible, if I understand the purpose of my company, the purpose kind of gets me across that one result that is ill-defined, but I'm clear which the direction that we're going as an organization. So I can operate even if I'm not fully clear on the results being sought because my manager or myself, I didn't think to define that step clearly, but the purpose kind of pulls me through in a way that an ill-defined, accidentally overlooked result uh, may may not is that and then, well that's interesting but again then when you start to talk about accountability it's hard to hold that employee accountable to that ill-defined 
Exactly. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so, then, so then when they when they when they take that initiative, so to speak, to bring that clarity to their table so they can still move forward. There that's you something, go. That's something to recognize. And, yes. and that is that that is, you know, one of the the, the, the more challenging things is I, I hear people say, well, gosh, we just want people to, you know, to take initiative. I'm like, OK, but what is being achieved if what's being achieved is measurably providing success to the client and the organization? If they don't take initiative, is that a detriment? Because, again, to have to, to think that everybody, every single employee is like a go getter. Some people just want to come in, be great. That's it. Yes. And that's again, as long as they're delivering on what's expected of their role and it's measurably good and it's driving success to say that, well, but we want them to take initiative. Well, that's a tough one, right? To, 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 to bring a lot of people. So I, I think that's fundamentally one of, one of the sticking points that people have even with Roe is they think that they'll lose that, that's, that people will lose that sense of, of taking initiative. I'm like, well, when you start to address some of the obstacles, it, you might be surprised that it frees up time and resources for people to actually look at their work differently and they might lean in in a different way than they had in the past too. So that's a possibility. Yes, yeah, yes. You're, you're right with the, and see, I think too, the other thing I want to bring up about when you look at goals, people set goals. And what's interesting is sometimes if an organization doesn't meet a goal, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes it doesn't mean a bad thing for the client either. But when an organization doesn't deliver on an outcome, that's a problem. That typically is a problem for a client or a customer. So sometimes we set these aspirations. We want to make a trillion dollars. I'm like, okay, well, how do you, how do you do? And if you don't get there, what, what are the metrics to tell you what you could have done differently versus just hope harder and wish bigger? You know what I mean? So I think that's when we talk about things like goals and initiative and, and all that, that's where you get into those fuzzy things that it's silly to have that expectation be put on everybody because not everybody has that sense of same sense of drive. But we can get so clear about what's expected of the role and make sure that that's actually being delivered upon. Michael, you know, the last question that I have for you, I really appreciate the, the, uh, just, just the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So, but before we go, let me ask you this, is there anything pressing or top of mind for you right now relative to, you know, row as an overall strategy or row in the, you know, with the election coming up or the, you know, impending, right. The impending economic doom that a lot of economists are forecasting or like, yeah. is there anything that's, you know, pressing or top of mind for you relative to, to what we've been discussing? Yeah. I mean, what's, what's always at top of mind for me is, is I, I boil it back down to the individual. Like I, I firmly believe that um, implementing role will benefit the business. I absolutely believe that. And uh, yay, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, and what I'm really connected with is the absolute benefit it has to each individual as they want to define it. And what's interesting when you bring up like, you know, impending doom uh, economically and election, you know, there's a lot of people right now that can't vote until the end of the day. Why is that? Because they're at work, right? Uh, there's a lot of people that might be worried about impending, uh, impending economic, you know, economic doom. Yet they have a skill set or a hobby that they could put time into, and you know, have a nice little side hustle. But they can't. Why? Because I got to work this particular way in this one job, and that's why I try to tell people. I teach two to four classes every semester. I'm a life coach with a couple of clients, and I do this. That's not me going look at all the stuff I do. I couldn't do that without a real mindset. I would be stuck. So I think. I wish that people would think on all levels within organizations, what can we do to raise the level of, of not just control, but compassion for each of us to realize that I can be successful and I can be supportive to my, my coworkers, my leadership and my clients, but in a way that may not be known to everyone else around me. And just because it's not known to everyone else around me doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not worthy of being engaged in. Absolutely. Michael Brada, thank you so yeah. much for your time this afternoon. I greatly thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's podcast. If you'd like more information about results only work environment and culture RX, visit goro.com. To connect with Michael directly, visit michaelbarada.org. And you can always reach us at insights at manageengine.com or in the comments section below. Thanks again to Michael for joining me and thank you for watching.